Good morning, and welcome to First Christian Church's online worship service. This is the third week that we have worshiped together online rather than gathered together here in our sanctuary. And if you are like me, you are looking forward to the time when we will gather here once again. But until it is safe to do so, I hope you will stay home and stay well and trust that God is present in our worship no matter where we are or how we gather. When the COVID-19 virus threat became real to us here in Ohio, we were halfway through the season of Lent and our Lenten worship series, Entering the Passion of Jesus. And so we wanted to finish that series. I hope that you will be part of our Holy Week prayer vigil on Maundy Thursday evening into Good Friday. Just contact us and let us know what time you wish to be in prayer. We do thank once again Susan and Tim who are providing um, help with our service and for our technical support that uh, we are indebted to Sam Grubbs and Greg Rhodes. As we move next week into Easter and the season of Easter in the weeks to follow, we're going to try to streamline our services a bit to make them work better for online worship and to be able to include our folks uh, who are not connected to the internet. Our worship committee is planning an Easter sunrise service using Zoom, and we will have Easter worship again online next week, beginning at 8.30 a.m., as we have the last few weeks. So be sure to join us on Easter Sunday. I will invite you once again to go to the kitchen and find communion elements if you have not already do so did so so that we might share communion as the time comes in the service. Throughout Lent, we have been taking up-close looks at the events of the last week of Jesus' life. Today, we enter Holy Week and conclude our series of Entering the Passion of Jesus based on the book by Amy Jill Levine. Today is Palm Sunday and the beginning of Holy Week, not only in the scriptures, but on the calendar. So let's take a deep breath in this Holy Week and let us worship God. During Lent, we have taken six weeks to move through one week, the last week of Jesus' human life. This has allowed us to expand time, to freeze frame important moments and dig deeper into our faith story and our own stories. This morning marks the end of Lent and the beginning of our commemoration of Holy Week. And so let us speed up time a bit as we first remember the entrance of Jesus into Jerusalem.
we found our place in the parade and considered our place in the picture, our role as supporters of Jesus' mission in the world. And then we found ourselves in the midst of the chaos and throngs of people in Jerusalem for the Passover. We stopped there. Suspending the action for a moment, wondering how we could join Jesus in clearing out our own lives and hearts, our own places of worship, to make them a more welcoming place for the love of God to fully reside. We followed Jesus as he continued to teach in the city and among the people at the temple. His teachings filled our hearts as they filled those long ago, and we remembered the call to proclaim justice in the midst of injustice wherever we find it. We joined the disciples at the table of extravagant affection and overflowing love. And then another supper where all our assumptions about the way the world works were turned upside down. This week, as we join Jesus in the garden, Gethsemane is the moment when a chain of events begins that cannot be halted. Once Jesus is taken into custody, there is no going back. So we pause a moment with him in the garden just before his arrest, and we feel with him the temptations that arise when facing difficult circumstances. To run, hide, use whatever power we have to change things, fight it, perhaps even bargain with God. We walk among the sleepy disciples who just can't grasp what is about to happen? Enter, enter the story, enter the place you belong, not just looking on, for this is your story. Enter the story. Let us pray together the prayer of confession. Here we are, loving God. We find ourselves alongside you in a garden of grief for the violence so many of this world endure. We are tired. We don't know what to do next. And so we sleep sometimes, hoping to awake from a bad dream. Forgive us, O oh God. Help us face this hour knowing you are always here. You only ask the same of us, to be present, to be awake. You entered our story through Jesus. Now help us to enter fully into the story of your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Enter. Enter the story, enter the place you belong, not just looking on, for this is your story, enter the story. Let this story remind us that no matter what we face or how we fail to meet the demand of the moment, second chances are possible. You are forgiven and freed, encouraged and loved by a God who wants you to live fully. Let us enter the passion of Christ.
Jesus' defense in those moments in the garden was prayer. Not a sword that one of the disciples wanted to use to protect him, but prayer was his source of power, that God's will would sustain him through the next day. Jesus knows what is about to go down, and he will not use violence in these last hours. Let's listen to these words from the Gospel of Mark. Jesus and his disciples came to a place called Gethsemane. Jesus said to them, sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John along with him. He began to feel despair and was anxious. He said to them, I'm very sad. It's as if I'm dying. Stay here and keep alert. Then he went a short distance farther and fell to the ground. He prayed that if possible, he might be spared the time of suffering. He said, Abba, Father, for you all things are possible. Take this cup of suffering away from me. However, not what I want, but what you want. He came and found them sleeping. He said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Couldn't you stay alert for one hour? Stay alert and pray so that you won't give in to temptation. The spirit is eager, but the flesh is weak. Again, he left them and prayed, repeating the same words. And again, when he came back, he found them sleeping, for they couldn't keep their eyes open, and they didn't know how to respond to him. He came a third time and said to them, Will you sleep and rest all night? That's enough. The time has come for the Son of Man to be betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up. Let's go. Look. Here comes my betrayer. Suddenly, while Jesus was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, came with a mob carrying swords and clubs. They had been sent by the chief priests, legal experts, and elders. His betrayer had given them a sign, arrest the man I kiss and take him away under guard. As soon as he got there, Judas said to Jesus, Rabbi. Then he kissed him. Then they came and grabbed Jesus and arrested him. One of the bystanders drew a sword and struck the high priest's slave and cut off his ear. Jesus responded, Have you come with swords and clubs to arrest me like an outlaw? Day after day I was with you teaching in the temple, but you didn't arrest me. But let the scriptures be fulfilled. And all his disciples left him and ran away. One young man, a disciple, was wearing nothing but a linen cloth. They grabbed him, but he left the linen cloth behind and ran away naked. To see the King of heaven fall in anguish to his ears, the light and hope of all the world now overwhelmed with grief what nameless horrors must he see to cry out in the garden oh take this cup away Yet not my will, but yours. Yet not my will, but yours. To know each friend will fall away and heaven's voice be still. For hell to have its vengeful day upon Golgotha's hill. No words describe the Savior's plight to be by God forsaken. Till wrath and love are satisfied and every And every sin is paid. 
what took him to this wretched place what kept him on the road his love for adam's cursed race for every broken soul no sin too slight to overlook no crime too great to carry all mingled in this poisoned cup and yet he drank it all the savior drank it all too much wine perhaps or maybe i'm so sleepy because i'm just so very tired this week is taking its toll on me, watching our every step, wondering when the other shoe will drop, afraid that the commotion stirred up about Jesus will result in something terrible. I've been on edge ever since we got here. But oh my, that parade. Who would have thought that this man I met on the shores of my fishing spot would turn out to be three years of nonstop surprises? The entrance into Jerusalem was more amazing than all of it combined. I felt sure that I was part of something that was going to change everything. Now, I'm not so sure. Not everyone, it turned out, was so pleased about Jesus' arrival here. And we've been under scrutiny for days. Then, tonight at the table, Jesus revealed that one of us was about to hand him over. I'm noticing who is missing here in the garden, and I'm wondering if maybe he was right. My gut turns over with the thought of it. I do not want to face that these people who have become my family could turn against one another under pressure. Fear threatens our very bonds. So why put ourselves out here in the open? I need to stay awake, keep watch. I've got my sword. I know Jesus told me not to bring it, but come on. All he seems to think we need to do is pray. He asked us to pray with him, yes, I pray, I'm praying, I'm fervently praying, but is it enough? How can God help us if soldiers arrive? And yet, I'm so sleepy. Enter, enter the story, enter the place you be. Because our worship is online again this week i will not lift up our specific prayer requests by name but they have been sent to the email prayer group and um, we can certainly share those with you if uh, you give us a call also if you have a specific prayer concern during our time apart please give the church or me a call because we do want to know we of course are in prayer this week for all who are ill for those who are facing or recovering from surgery this week. We lift up all of those who are suddenly without work as well as those whose job or the health and well-being of our community are very demanding in these uncertain days. We remember those who work to make our world and our community a safer existence for all people. We pray God's energy and well-being on our health care workers and those who are called upon to make difficult decisions. We pray for those who are lonely and those who feel afraid. Let us join our hearts in prayer. Oh God, how quickly we walk into Lent with enthusiasm and vigor. We were determined to reach Easter as true Easter people, full of hope and intent on charity and kindness and love. But somewhere along the way, our steps falter. Our pace slackens. We trudge along with slumped shoulders, and our gait becomes uneven. Everything we know is changing. And so we come to this holy week, and we are only plodding one foot in front of the other, 
and our hearts become as heavy as our feet. Forgive us, God. Stir us with a rushing wind that we might look up from the ground to the ma majesty of the trees dancing in the wind. Let the breeze carry with it a whispered reminder that you walk with us even to the end of time. Force us to step more lively and breathe deeply that we might reawaken the gift of the Holy Spirit within us. Help us move into this Holy Week and beyond. In the name of our crucified and risen Savior, amen. As we come to what would be our usual time of offering, in our worship service, we, we do still want to help people. We want to do good in the world at this time of need. But we can't even worship together, much less receive an offering. And so it is certainly a bit of a challenge to keep things going around here, but we do want to thank all of you who have put a, a check in the mail or uh, taken up one of the online banking options available or uh, giving through our online giving that we began just at the end of the year. If you have any questions about those, we can certainly answer those um, here in the church office. Thank you for the ways that you continue to allow ministry to take place in this time and place in our community. As we come to our time of communion, of course, we would rather be sharing this here in our sanctuary. But this is the time to, to prepare those elements that you uh, have ready. And so that as we share our time of communion, you might be able to join along with us. Do you remember back six weeks ago when we shared together on Ash Wednesday? We took those and wrote on a little piece of paper the things we wanted to let go of for Lent. And then we burned them, took those ashes, mixed it with some gesso, and prepared a canvas. And on the, the rough ashes of that canvas, we had been watching and as God to see what God could do with the canvas of our lives. And so we have, um, today I want to show you that canvas once again as we enter into this time of communion. We are reminded that no matter how imperfect how many mistakes we make, how much we falter, that God can take the canvas of our lives and let us begin again. Let us start anew. God can do beautiful things with the canvas of our lives. As we prepare to gather around this, our Lord's table, let us sing together. Here is bread.
as we gather here around our Lord's table, we remember that on the last night of his life, he shared this meal with those he loved. And during that meal, he took bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he said, take, eat, this is my body broken for you. As often as you eat this bread, remember me. And then after supper, he took the cup. Again, he blessed it and gave it to them and said, this cup is the new covenant. It's poured out for you for the forgiveness of sin. As often as you drink of it, remember me. The gifts of God for the people of God. And we are grateful. We're in the final weeks of our Lenten worship series using Amy Jill Levine's book, Entering the Passion of Jesus. We have been looking at the risk of following Jesus during the last week of his life. And this week we arrive at Gethsemane, the biggest risk of all. And in these last two weeks, since we cannot be together, we've been using videos by Amy Jill Levine, exploring further the scripture passage for the week. Let's take a look at the video for this week. We sometimes talk about the Garden of Gethsemane, and already we have problems. In the Gospels of Matthew and Mark, we have Gethsemane. John gives us a garden. But let's think about that garden for a minute. It was in the Garden of Eden where Adam and Eve faced temptation and they failed. But now at Gethsemane, in John's garden, Jesus himself will face temptation, and the temptation of the most difficult sort, not one coming from Satan, not one coming from someone else, but his own personal temptation to flee or to accept the cross. When Jesus prays, Father, let this cup pass from me, let's not pass over that cup too quickly. When we think about cups in the scriptures of Israel, we might think about the Psalm, my cup runneth over. We think of love and compassion and joy and happiness. But this is a different type of cup in Gethsemane. This is a cup of fate, of torture, of death. It's not a cup from which Jesus wants to drink. And we should also think about the cup that Jesus shared with his followers at his Last Supper. And when Jesus hands his followers that cup, when people participate in that cup during a church service, what kind of cup is one drinking? a cup of happiness and joy, a cup of bitterness, a cup of temptation, a cup of community. Think about the cup rather than just pass it by.
In Paul's epistle to the Philippians chapter 2, he has this beautiful poem, it might actually be a hymn, in which he talks about how the Christ was in the form of God, but didn't feel the necessity of grasping that divinity. But the Christ empties himself out, takes on human form, indeed the form of a slave. What does it mean to give up all your privilege, to give up all your power, to become a servant, indeed a slave for everyone? That's one of the teachings that Jesus offers, and more than just talking about it, he actually does it. When Jesus says, let this cup pass from me, he doesn't want to suffer crucifixion, he doesn't want to die. But that's not a sign of lack of faith in God. To the contrary, it's a sign of enormous faith. Indeed, it's what prophets frequently do. Jeremiah doesn't want to be a prophet. It's hard to be a prophet. It's even harder to accept the fate of a prophet. So Jesus, like Jeremiah, doesn't want to drink from that cup. And he recognizes he has a choice here. He prays to God to say, here's how I feel. And he knows that God will love him, indeed, regardless of the choice that he makes. And because he is confident in that love, he can choose the fate he needs to choose. Jesus brings his disciples with him to Gethsemane. And he takes three of them, the three who witnessed his own transfiguration, Peter, James, and John. And he says, pray with me, stay awake. But they fall asleep and Jesus prays and he comes back to his friends, but rather than watching and remaining awake, they have fallen asleep. Could you not stay awake just a little while longer, he asks. And he goes to pray again and again they fall asleep. The insiders, the ones who witnessed him in all his glory, who heard his teaching, who saw his miracles, cannot stay awake, cannot meet his need. And the irony is that while the insiders fail him, the outsiders remain true. The anointing woman whose name we do not have in Matthew and Mark, she represents fidelity. She's there, as Jesus says, to anoint him for his burial. And when Jesus dies, it's the centurion, the Roman army officer, who is with him when he dies and who is able to proclaim him son of God. So the gospels ask, are you an insider? Are you an outsider? Have you failed? Have you remained true? And if you have failed, if you have fallen asleep, recognize that there's still a continuation of your story as well. When Jesus goes to Gethsemane, he knows he is going to be arrested. He knows he is going to die. And this was his choice. When he prays, let this cup pass from me, he knows that that's a possibility. Indeed, he did not have to go to Gethsemane he did not have to allow Judas to engage in the betrayal. He could have run away. He had a choice, but he doesn't. He stays to accept his fate because he has trust in God that everything will work out according to divine plan. When the Gospels were first taught, they weren't taught in little snippets or little lectionary readings. They were performed from the beginning to the end, as today we might, for example, see a movie. And what happens in the Gospels, as with any good symphony, with any good movie, themes repeat. Gethsemane echoes not only the temptation of Jesus by Satan in the wilderness, but it also echoes the Our Father. When Jesus teaches his followers to pray, lead us not into temptation. Now Jesus himself is brought into temptation. He doesn't ask from his followers anything more than he himself has experienced and has endured. In Christian theology, Jesus is God, but he's also fully human with all of our emotions, our fears, our temptations, and our strengths. 
In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus is arrested on the evening of Passover, and the Last Supper would have been a Passover meal, a Passover Seder. The Passover celebrates not only the exodus of the Israelite slaves from Egypt, but also the passing over of the angel of death so that the Jewish children are not killed. And what do we have here in Gethsemane? We have a type of Passover as well, but in this case, on this evening, the Son of God, God's firstborn Son, according to Christian theology. On this night, he will be condemned to death. Gethsemane is the biggest risk of all. Jesus is about to be arrested. Could he have uh, stopped his arrest? Of course. Could he have run away? Of course. His disciples were armed. He could have asked them to do something. Instead, he tells his followers to pray. The risk is knowing he can save himself and choosing not to do so. The disciples risk as well. Jesus says, stay awake, and they can't. They fail. On our journey through Lent, we have looked at stories of risk, of tragedy, of loss, and of remarkable courage, and of second chances. We too are vulnerable and fearful. We too have deserted. We too have failed to stop what cannot be stopped. Lent cuts us down, and in the rawness, that openness, we can begin to heal. This Holy Week, before we get to the resurrection, there will be suffering and crucifixion and death. As we close our service for today, will you join us in singing Beneath the Cross of Jesus? May you be blessed by the sacred frames that surround the moments of your life that you dare not miss. Know that God is with you no matter what this week holds. Go in peace. Amen.